planet Earth. 200 million years in the future. It's a world of extremes. Vast baking deserts stretching for thousands of kilometers. Fringed by lush forests of huge trees where torrential rain falls every day. But even more extreme than the planet, the creatures that inhabit this strange new world. These are totally new designs, like nothing the Earth has ever seen before. But, as bizarre as they seem, they're all the result of the process of evolution. Life on Earth is very different in 200 million years time because the geography of the planet is always changing. The Earth's surface is broken into huge plates that move slowly over the face of the globe, carrying the continents with them. And in time, that movement will create an entirely new world. In 200 million years time, the continents will once again come together to form one huge landmass. This has already happened in Earth's history. 200 million years ago, the continents were fused again into one huge landmass, which is called Pangaea. So in 200 million years' time, we will have a new Pangaea, a new supercontinent, surrounded on all sides by ocean. This new geography is not the only reason why life is so different. The main reason lies a hundred million years before this new Pangaea formed. Evolution was given the opportunity to experiment with new designs because of a catastrophe that wiped the slate clean. Every so often in the history of the Earth, violent eruptions spew out toxic gases and dust, acidifying the atmosphere and blotting out the sun. An event like this is disastrous for life, a biological catastrophe, a mass extinction. A mass extinction is when a very substantial percentage of the species that are alive on the planet disappear in a very short period of time. Now, a short period of time to a geologist might be 10, 15, 20,000 years, but relative to the millions of years that we're talking, this is a, it's like that. Things are gone. What do we have left? Only those few organisms that are generalist enough to get through that period of environmental transition. So what comes out of that hundred million year in the future extinction may be something you would never have expected. It would be random in the sense you never would have predicted it. As whole ecosystems collapse, creatures that we take for granted are wiped out. Fish could disappear completely from the surface waters of the ocean. But the seas wouldn't stay empty for long. A hundred million years after the mass extinction, there are new creatures in the ocean. Silver swimmers. This might look like a totally new design but it's around today if you know where to look. 
if you go out in the sea now and you, and you haul a plankton net through it, what you get is a wide variety, a very diverse set of tiny crustaceans, the larval forms of many shrimp and crabs and lobsters whose adults live on the bottom. The larval forms are quite small, but they can't just get bigger. Eventually, they have to turn into the adults that, that live on the seafloor and reproduce there. But suppose some of them actually began to reproduce in the plankton. Now, this happens actually often in evolution, where a larval or a juvenile form develops the ability to reproduce in that form without having to turn into the adult. And by so doing, it seems like a whole new life form is created, in this case, the silver swimmers in the seas. In fact, it's just the movement of the reproductive stage from the adult form into the juvenile form. This evolutionary trick is called neoteny. But once silver swimmers made their appearance in the world, they could change and adapt to fill all the niches left by fish. From open ocean swimmers to deep sea scavengers. From sleek predators to giant plankton feeders. A process called adaptive radiation. In 200 million years' time, the global ocean is full of new designs. But it was only a matter of luck that the ancestor of the silver swimmer survived, and not something else. But some places are immune to these disasters, places that provide a refuge, arcs from which the Earth could be recolonized. One of these places is the deep ocean. Down here, for example, there are still sharks. And although they look a bit like today's sharks, they're very different. Sharks are magnificent creatures in today's seas, and they've survived mass extinctions in the past. And in the future, they survive as well. And they bring with them all the talents they have today, including a magnificent ability to sense the environment. The head is covered with sensors that detect smell, vibration, and electrical impulses. And all these sensors are channeled into a simple brain. The Sharkopath has taken this system further. Bioluminescent patches on its side flash when the shark picks up a signal. The speed of flashing depends on the strength of the signal, so the sharks can monitor each other. They communicate. Hunting together in a group, if one shark detects a faint signal, the rest can follow it. So these sharks sweep through the ocean in huge arrays, searching for the slightest trace of their prey's scent. Then, as one shark signals that it's picked up the scent, the rest turn, and the array tracks the scent to its source. Their victim, though, is virtually invisible. But close in, the sharks can still track their prey by sensing the electrical currents in its nervous system. Eventually, surrounded and trapped, their victim's camouflage breaks down. It's a huge, 40-meter-long rainbow squid, another familiar-looking survivor of the mass extinction that once lived in the deep. But time has run out for this rainbow squid. What is it about the deep that allowed some creatures to survive the mass extinction? The answer lies on the seabed in the middle of the ocean. 
In the pitch dark, thousands of meters down on the volcanic mid-ocean ridges, superheated water, black with minerals, gushes up from the ocean bed. These deep sea vents are covered in bacteria that get their energy from minerals in the water instead of sunlight. And in turn, the bacteria support a whole ecosystem, totally independent of the sun. Creatures living down here would hardly have noticed the catastrophic mass extinction happening above. But there are other places that could provide refuge from the mass extinction. As the continents slowly came together over a hundred million years, huge cave systems were formed in thick beds of limestone. And gradually, marine creatures found their way into the cave system. There are bacteria in these caves, luminescent bacteria living on minerals seeping out of the limestone. And just as with the deep sea vents, these bacteria support a whole ecosystem. But in this case, of giant worms. Gloom worms feed on the bacterial mats. And even bigger monsters feed on the gloom worms. The slick ribbon. A meter long carnivorous worm. Apart from the dim glow of the bacteria, it's dark down here. But the slick ribbon doesn't need light to hunt. A swimming garden worm creates swirls and vortices in the water, and the slick ribbon can sense these. Such a trail lasts a long time, and the slick ribbon can follow the garden worm's path with deadly accuracy in pitch darkness. The garden worm has an escape mechanism. It squirts out a cloud of noxious fluid, confusing the slick ribbon, giving the garden worm time to get away. All the different worms living in these caves evolved from one ancestor, a marine worm that survived the extinction to find its way into the cave system. Here it evolved into many different species, all adapted to life in the perpetual gloom. But not all the caves are dark. In a few places they open to the surface, forming pools. And this link to the sunlit world above is vital for garden worms. They leave the underworld to bask in the sunlight. And this is how they feed themselves. This new design is two ancient lifestyles combined. A plant and an animal living together. A symbiosis. The fleshy, leaf-like structures extending from the worm's body act like real leaves because they're packed full of algae. Minute, single-celled plants that convert sunlight and carbon dioxide into food. It's a curious fact that many animals have learned to live symbiotically with algae. There are even flatworms, which uh, uh, are bright green because of the algae within them. They don't have any normal stomach, they absorb food directly, and they have to bask in sunlight to grow their own food, if you like. Today, convoluta worms are found on a few beaches, where they sunbathe at low tide. Sunbathing can be dangerous. As the tide comes back in, the worms disappear into the sand or they risk being eaten by predators.
In the future, garden worms always stay close to the edge of the water. With good reason. Beyond the pools, a harsh, bleak desert stretches for thousands of kilometers. 200 million years in the future, 90% of the land is like this, a baking desert. And again, this is due to the new arrangement of the Earth's continents. One of the things that happens all of the continents become grouped together. You have one huge landmass surrounded by one huge ocean. This has an influence on climate, and the climates become more extreme. As you move into the center of this huge continent, getting increasingly distant from the sources of oceanic moisture, the continent dries out, and the center of the supercontinent, much like Pangaea in the past, will be an enormous desert. This desert stretches for 6,000 kilometers. Yet even in such a harsh landscape, there's life. Something has built these strange towers. But what? One of the few groups of organisms that could survive are the insects. Insects have been around an extraordinarily long time. 400 million years ago, they came out onto land along with the first plants. They've survived everything that nature has been able to throw at them since. And I've no doubt at all that whatever happens in the future, if anything survives, it will include the insects. Terabytes. Descended from termites, they built the towers. And these are on a raiding party. Like their termite ancestors, terabytes are vegetarians. Their targets are the garden worms, for the algae in their leaves. But first they have to catch the worm. Terabytes, though, have a solution. Specialized glue spitters fire sticky threads at the garden worm, slowing it down just enough to snatch a few chunks of precious algae. Eventually, the worm breaks free. But these tiny insects can attack such large prey because terabytes have an elaborate, complex social system. And that includes division of labor. The termites of the future have taken the social caste system that they have today even further. They now have a specialized caste of transporters that carry other specialized termites around to do different jobs within the colony. So the transporters will take the individuals with the chemical weapons to where they're needed, they'll take biters to another place. So the whole system has gone up one level of complexity. The terabyte mounds are as complex as terabyte social lives. The towers are more than just protection from the sun. In the top of the turrets, translucent windows let in light. Inside, the terabytes have built special chambers, greenhouses with raised beds, for cultivating the algae stolen from the garden worms. So terabytes are farmers. But growing algae in the middle of the desert isn't easy. At the bottom of the nest, there's an air conditioning unit. These veins are kept damp, and as the water evaporates, it cools the veins, which in turn cools the air above them. The cold air sinks and creates a circulation through a complex arrangement of ducts, which draws carbon dioxide rich air up from the nest chambers into the greenhouse. But this whole system depends on water. To get to this water, another cast of terabytes produce hydrochloric acid that dissolves the hard limestone.
The terabytes can then reach the water, 10 meters below them in the caves underneath the desert. Transporter terabytes use the tunnels to reach the water table, where they collect yet another cast of terabytes, the water carriers. The water carriers, bloated with water, are taken back through the tunnels to the nest far above. And here, the water carriers form a living irrigation system. Filtered desert sunlight, water and plenty of carbon dioxide create ideal conditions for the algae to grow. And this food supplies the whole colony. Outside, with temperatures climbing above 50 degrees, the desert appears bleak and lifeless for thousands of kilometers. In contrast, over the hundred million years since the mass extinction, life has flourished in the global ocean. Silver swimmers have taken the place of fish in the warm, sunlit surface water. And above the surface, even more strange creatures have evolved to take the place of birds. These bizarre flying creatures are flesh. Flish look at first sight a little like birds. They're brightly coloured, they flap their wings in rather similar ways. But they've evolved completely separately from a very different ancestor. Flish, as their name suggests, evolved from fish. There are some fish today that can leave the water. There are even fish that can glide for short distances above the surface. But none of today's fish use powered flight. In the future, flesh have evolved powered flight, but how? Some fish today have developed muscles around their pectoral fins and use those fins to move around. Once you've learnt to move your forelimb, and once you've developed the musculature around the base of the fin, which means you can generate a lot of force with that, then getting into the air with it is very easy. You can imagine the animal might jump out of the water to escape a predator. A bigger fish trying to catch it, the easiest way is to go into the air, because it can't see you. Once you do that, then you start flapping the fin in air, so you travel further. That enables you to get to new habitats, new food sources. So there's strong advantages in doing this. Fish developing powered flight sounds unlikely at first, but something similar has happened in the past. In vertebrate animals, flights evolved at least three times. In every case, flights appeared by using the forelimb, exactly the same bones of our arm. But the way they've done it, the way the anatomy is varied between the different groups, is quite different. In every case, it's the same end result. You need a large surface, which you can move and control, used to generate aerodynamic force, which you use to fly. All of the animals have used these bones, the upper arm of the humerus, the lower arm, the ulna and the radius, and then the bones of the hand. In birds, most of the hand has disappeared. There are just two fingers fused together. And the feathers, which are the main flight surface, go off the end of the hand. But in bats, it's all five fingers. The fingers are spread, the skin goes across between the tips of them, and that forms the wing. 
And that's also the way that pterosaurs, the third group of flying vertebrates that lived alongside the dinosaurs, developed their wings. The structure of a flish wing is different again, but the physics of flight means that all wings look roughly the same, a process known as convergent evolution. So, from a distance, a flish looks very much like a bird or a bat. In the future, flish soar over the ocean, searching for the bright patterns of silver swimmer shoals just below the surface. But not everything is what it seems in this global ocean. The silver swimmer image was a pattern of light and dark playing over the body of a giant rainbow squid. Over 200 million years, squid haven't changed their appearance but they have changed their behavior. Rainbow squid have such sophisticated control of body texture and color that to a large silver swimmer, even a 40 meter long squid seems invisible as it mimics the colors and patterns of the ocean surface. But if the silver swimmer comes too close, the squid can change and create a spectacular display of warning colors. Even today, squid produce amazing displays of color. They use special organs on their surface called chromatophores. These are muscular organs in the skin. And they're little sacs that contain pigment. And they're muscular and they can open and close. And when they're open, you can see the color spot. When they're closed, you can't. Different colors can be mixed in individual chromatophores, so you have a huge uh, palette of colors available. And the most amazing thing is that each of those chromatophores is commanded by a nerve or several nerves, maybe, from the brain. These elaborate patterns are controlled by a complex nervous system. And that needs a powerful brain. All the cephalopods uh, living today are probably uh, highly intelligent, judged by their brain to body size, which is a you know, rough indicator of intelligence when comparing different types of animals. Squid is uh, sort of on the level of a bird, uh, way higher than fish, for example. 200 million years from now, if squid tendency to evolve its nervous system, a centralized nervous system continues the way it has been, these animals will be awesome, intelligent beings. Future squid will be able to create very sophisticated patterns. And they could even use their bodies to display and communicate like giant video screens. It's possible that future squid could combine this with luminescence. So at night, they'd create a dazzling show of lights. These displays could be used for mating when the males gather to compete for a female. They show off their intelligence with their spectacular pattern making and a female will choose the male with the brightest and most complex pattern. As day breaks, the squid change back to their silver swimmer patterns to draw in more flesh. But there's another danger in this ocean that affects all the creatures here. The global ocean will be warmer than today, and as in all tropical seas, there'll be storms. In the future, they will be hypercanes.
The strongest hurricane that we have perhaps today is around about sort of 170 miles per hour or something like that, but you could easily get storms going up to 200, 250 miles per hour over a warmer ocean. If you think about sort of a modern hurricane, think about sort of hitting Florida or something like that, well, add 50% to everything. Add the strength of the wind, the rain, the battering power. Anything caught up in the storm, like a flish, is completely helpless in the howling winds. The winds carry the flish far inland, across the huge mountain range that runs down the eastern coast. As the storm subsides, the flish have been dumped in a very different place, somewhere they could never survive, a desert. This is the hottest part of the great supercontinental desert. It lies in the rain shadow of the mountain range. The winds drop all their rain on the mountains, so this landscape is bone dry. Every year, large numbers of flish die in the desert. But even dead flish can be eaten, an opportunity for something to exploit. Bumble beetles have evolved to feed on dead flish and nothing else. But first, they have to find them. You need an animal with a very sophisticated sensory system so that as soon as one of these events happens, they can detect it, move fast, whatever distance is required, in order to utilize the food source. Today, antennae provide insects with a long-range sensory system. But antennae are big and produce a lot of drag in flight, a disadvantage for a long-distance flyer like the bumble beetle. So over their bodies, they have a large number of sensory hairs that are equipped with special smelling organs that can pick up even the most minute trace of the appropriate chemical produced by the rotting flesh. The sensory hairs on their legs and their antennae can be folded away in flight, reducing drag. The beetle also has stiff wing cases that give extra lift. And a large store of fat provides fuel. But even so, a bumble beetle can only fly for 24 hours. Not always long enough to find a flish carcass in a vast desert. But when it does find one, the story isn't over. This flish is already occupied by a grim worm. All the beetle can do is keep flying. During the day, high temperatures keep most other desert creatures out of sight. They only come out in the cool of the evening. These are desert hoppers. Hopping snails. Desert-dwelling, hopping snails seems like an unlikely twist of evolution, but it is feasible. Today there are hopping snails, cone shells, but they live underwater. And snails don't usually move like this. 
Land snails move on a bed of slime, but this uses water, a scarcity in a parched desert. Instead of gliding on a trail of slime which just wastes precious water and protein, uh, these snails will develop a muscular foot, a strong muscular leathery foot that they can jump with um, and actually leap off the ground much like a kangaroo. That allows them to colonize huge areas of desert looking for patches of scrubby plants. But there are plants in this desert that fight back, laying traps for unsuspecting desert hoppers. This is a death bottle plant, large, poisonous and carnivorous. Carnivorous plants exist today, and each has its own unique method of capturing prey and soaking it in digestive juices. So how is the future death bottle plant different? It is different because it is predating upon a much larger size prey. Most uh, carnivorous plants today are dealing with insects. They're not out after uh, things that could be measured in many ounces. One other feature that makes it stand apart is because it is working on bigger prey, it has something that has the potential, once that prey has fallen into the trap, to do damage to the trap. So when you need to immobilize that prey item very quickly. So in this case, uh, instead of simply killing it off by immersing it in the digestive juices, the death bottle trap actually has poisoned spines that will kill the organism before it can thrash around. Over the next few hours, the plant will digest the unfortunate sandhopper. And it resets its trap by regrowing the lid. So the death bottle plant has solved the problem of feeding itself in this barren, sterile soil. But how to reproduce? The plant produces this strange looking flower that bears a strong resemblance to a dead fish. It even smells like a dead fish, which attracts the attention of a passing bumble beetle. So down comes the bumble beetle, tracked in by both the smell, which gives it a sense of here comes another free meal and the appearance. It goes into what it thinks is a wound within this, what it perceives to be a flesh, and it ends up falling into another kind of flask-like trap, except this one is lined by the seeds. The seeds are sticky, and the bumble beetle sort of bumps around trying to get its way out, and the seeds get stuck all over it. And at some point in its attempts to escape the trap, it lights upon a particular portion of the inside of the trap that is more lightly colored, which happens to be a completely surprise-laden spring. And when it hits that particular point within the flower, the flower literally catapults the bumble beetle out. Now, covered in seeds, the bumble beetle is still searching for a dead fish. But it's running out of fuel. A dead fish draws bumble beetles from all over the desert. It takes the last reserves of energy to fight for the carcass. As it fights, the death bottle seeds are sown all around the fish carcass, the only fertilizer in the barren desert. This is the end of the journey for the victorious bumble beetle and the end of its useful life. Its exhausted body splits open to reveal grimworms. Grimworms are actually the bumble beetle's larvae and they've been growing and feeding inside their mother even as she searched for a flesh. Now they burrow into the carcass to finish their life cycle. 
to grow into bumble beetles before the scorching sun dries out the flesh. This desert is vast, but not all the planet is covered in desert. On the northwest coast, torrential rainfall creates a vast forest. Massive trees, mostly conifers, flourish in the continual rain. But why does it rain so much, and for so long? It will be subjected to the normal westerlies, and those westerlies will bring huge amount of water. You're going over huge expanses of ocean, very warm temperatures probably, so it's an incredibly moist environment. Think about sort of Seattle or something like that, but raining all the time, every day. That's what it's going to be like. Beneath the conifers, there are giant lichens. Instead of just covering rocks and logs, they now grow up to three meters tall. And living among the branches, forest flesh. They're relatives of the ocean flesh, but have left the ocean completely and spend all their lives in the forest. They spend the nights roosting, hanging upside down under the branches. As the light begins to fail, any fish that are late returning to the roost are in danger. This is a slither sucker. Slither sucker is one of the more wonderful uh, envisionments for the future. These organisms are all around in the present day. If you know wh where to look for them, that uh, you will see them particularly on moist days, moving very slowly but moving across the forest floor. It's a slime mold. It's not one creature, but millions of individual predatory cells that cooperate to devour minute organisms. And it is feasible, in the future, for them to become more organized and bigger. So what we just witnessed that took in that poor unsuspecting flesh was a giant, much more organized descendant of one of these slime molds. A slither sucker needs to reproduce and spread to new areas. So it transforms itself into something that looks like the fruiting body of a lichen tree to enlist the help of a forest giant. This is a mega squid. A giant terrestrial squid. A giant squid living in a forest. Squid today, of course, live in the ocean. They've got no skeleton, they're just squishy. And they swim by changing the shape of their body. But 200 million years in the future, this animal could have got onto land. Now, when it first went onto land, it must have dragged itself along. But the mega squid has evolved from its arms, effectively legs. A mega squid doesn't have a skeleton, but it still has to support its massive eight-ton body. Each leg is made entirely of muscle running around and along its length. When the squid puts its weight down, the muscles contract. Muscle is incompressible, so the squid supports all eight tons by muscle power alone. Big animals have two legs, or most of them, the big mammals, have four today. But the mega squid's got eight. They're about equal in size and shape. It would move to, quite unlike any other animal we see. It can't move all of its legs randomly because it'll trip over. But if it moves the front and the back leg on one side and the middle legs on the other, then it moves the other pair. 
it will always be balanced and the legs won't hit into each other, so it can travel forward. But that's a gait we don't see in any living animal. Its arms have evolved into legs, but like its ancestors, the mega squid still has tentacles. And it uses them to pick off fruiting bodies from the lichen branches. Mega squid have evolved good color vision, so they can see bright colored objects in the dark forest. But remember the slither sucker? It changed its shape to look like a fruiting body and it's still on the branch, still waiting. It's not a perfect disguise, but it's enough to fool a mega squid. The sliver sucker has tricked the mega squid into giving it a free ride. It takes control of its host like some mind-altering sci-fi alien. Now we've got a problem, because the slither sucker is inside the mega squid. The mega squid can travel great distances and thereby carry the slither sucker uh, further than it could possibly crawl by itself. But the slither sucker is on the inside. How to get out? Well, in this case, we envision the following, and it's not a science fiction story, because there are circumstances that are very similar to this observed with snails in the present day. Remember that the slither sucker is an association of separate cells. Some of those cells migrate up to the brain, inflame the brain, and alter the behavior of the mega squid. They make the mega squid wander the forest, while the rest of the cells migrate to the air pouch that the squid uses to call. All it takes is for the mega squid to sneeze and the cells of the slither sucker have found a new home. And when finally the colony runs out, or we get rid of most of the cells within the poor mega squid, it finally settles down again. And you know, that was a tremendous hangover, but uh, it recovers and it goes on about its business. Squid could invade the land because the mass extinction wiped out the competition and nature abhors a vacuum. Evolution responded by creating radical new body designs. But there's another way evolution could respond to new opportunities. Intelligence. Squid already have a head start. And the agile, arboreal squibbon is the smartest squid around. an octopus-like creature that's taken to the trees and it's uh, quite the opposite of mega squid. It's a very fast, highly agile uh, swinger basically. It uses its long arms for swinging end over end uh, and it can do this because it's freed from a major constraint that uh, vertebrates had when they were swinging from trees and that is limited flexibility. Squibbons have a complex social life and the youngsters learn by play. Quick-witted and sharp, they hone their acrobatic skills chasing a forest flish. They've yet to learn about the dangers of the forest. A mega squid is just as happy to eat squibbons as fruit. But the squibbon community won't abandon their baby. Squibbons are smaller than the mega squid, but they can outthink it. They harass the mega squid, pelting it with whatever they can find, distracting it. 
Eventually the baby is snatched to safety. Could this be the start of a new social intelligence? If there's going to be continued development of uh, further intelligence after 200 million years, I certainly believe it will be the cephalopods. A creature like a squibbin is just following through on three billion years of evolution of cephalopods uh, making bigger and better brains. And there's no reason they're going to stop doing that. Two hundred million years in the future, life has responded to new openings by producing the glimmer of a new intelligence. Could these forests be the birthplace of Earth's next civilization? We can never really know because so much in evolution is down to chance. Chance mutations and chance events in the environment. Even our own species, our whole civilization, is only here because of an accident. A mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period that wiped out the dinosaurs and gave mammals the chance to diversify. We can't be certain that the creatures we've just seen will evolve over 200 million years, but we do know that evolution could create creatures just as, if not more, fantastic.